Welcome to another edition of Badger Blitz TV, your Rivals.com destination for all things Wisconsin athletics. From the recruiting trail to inside Camp Randall Stadium to on the court at the Kohl Center, I'm Matt Perkins, joined, as always, by Rivals.com national recruiting analyst, my good friend, the Barney Rubble to my Fred Flintstone? I don't know. Either way, sure. it's Clint, it's Clint Cosgrove. It. Uh, Clint, how you doing today, buddy? I'm great, man. How are you doing, Matt? I mean, I'm I, I'm pretty good. It's Friday, you know. Looking forward to a long weekend. Uh, looking forward to July Fourth. So, uh, big week for Wisconsin recruiting. Uh, they landed Chris Tarek, who you just interviewed, uh, the offensive lineman from Glenbard West. Uh, everyone needs to make sure that they can check out Clint's interview with him over on Badger Blitz and on YouTube. I'm personally a big fan of Tarek. Uh, I thought he was a little underrated at 5.7. I thought he is a. I, I think he looks like an absolute 5.8 kid at minimum. He looks like a four star to me. Mm, you know, I was also a little bit surprised he picked Wisconsin. It sounded for a long time like he was an Iowa lean, but maybe with uh, the other news of Iowa recruiting, he wasn't a take anymore. I'm not exactly sure how that all went down. Either way, though, uh, he's a Badger Clint. A, what put Wisconsin over the top uh, over Iowa and Michigan, especially? And then secondly, what do you think is the strongest part of his game as a prospect? So, Chris, um, it really, I think it did come down to Iowa and Wisconsin in the end, uh, which is, you know, when I talked to him a while back, he grew up a Michigan fan. Um, I kind of addressed this in the interview, but uh, John Sigmund, who played at Wisconsin, is his offensive line coach, offensive coordinator, or was the offensive coordinator at Glenbard West. Uh, so he had some familiarity with the program. He went on his visits. I think he really connected with both coaching staffs at Iowa and Wisconsin. Um, he uh, he was still a take at Iowa. Uh, they, they would have taken him, uh, as far as I know. And um, really, I think the difference was probably I, he felt more comfortable at, in Madison as a city. Um, he said he connected with you know players on both teams. They were both his type of guys. Um, and he's like, the programs are very similar, <laughs> he said. But um, I just think he had some great relationships. Uh, he knew people at Wisconsin. Uh, it's closer to home. Madison just, you know, he just said it felt like home in the end. And uh, if anybody who saw the video and you see him put on that Wisconsin hat with his hair hanging out, I mean, he looks like he was he was born in Wisconsin, grew up in Wisconsin. He's going to fit right in. Um, as far as strongest part of his game, uh just he's an athletic kid. He's big and he can move. And you, you'll like this, uh, Perko. He plays uh, like uh, lacrosse, I think. And, uh, you know, so that says a lot, to, you know, his overall athletic ability. He's a competitor. Uh, he's a hard-nosed kid who wants to work. He's getting good coaching. Uh, now, you talk about his rating, and you see him as a 5.8 kid, and I don't disagree with that whatsoever. But what happened is there was a lot of uh, – well <laughs> – he was identified early. So I saw it first saw him a freshman uh, when he was a freshman. He had the frame. We didn't know if he'd put on the weight. Then he got up to like 340 pounds. And that was during COVID. He had a, you know, during the COVID season, didn't really have much uh, of a season in, in Illinois. And then, so teams, uh, you know, and that went into summer camp. So like he went to Iowa and, you know, they loved him. They're like, you just need to, you know, get some weight down. Then come spring, <laughs> You know, he's 295 pounds and he is moving and he's physical and he's uh, so you saw him all of a sudden, his stock skyrocketed. And so uh, I would not put him out of the four star conversation. Uh, and the good thing about his class is I think we rank it another three or four times before all of this is over. So I'll be able to see him in person during the season, uh, further evaluation. But I agree with you 100 percent. He is a heck of a player. I know when you text me and you're like, Tarek, huh? And I was like, he's 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 big time. He's a perfect fit, big time, big uh, big time player. He'll fit right in, and uh, he's going to compete. Like he's he's close to physically ready right now. Yeah, and I'm excited to also bring in some more interior guys. They've gotten they've been really tackle heavy the last couple of classes, and I think it's really good to bring in, especially like a high upside interior guy right now. It's probably something that they need in the pipeline moving forward. Another big win for Bob Bostad too in his first year back as. Yeah. The offensive line coach, and I think that's only going to keep rolling. I think that you know, Bostad is clearly out there with a, an energy and an attitude about the way he's going about recruiting and coaching, and I think it's really exciting for a lot of Wisconsin fans to see. What's not as exciting though is the state of quarterback recruiting. 
after Lincoln Kineholes went to Washington, uh, which was a little bit of a dark horse, I guess. For a while, it sounded like it was going to be Wisconsin or North Dakota State. I think that a lot of people forgot about the connection with both the state of South Dakota uh, that Kalen DeBoer has. He was a former head yeah. coach at Sioux Falls uh, and when they were the best NAIA team probably of all time. Uh, over a four I year- think he uh, four year only had four losses or something over like over the whole seasons. time he was there. I think it's I think he was sixty four and three is oh, if I'm I might oh be a little bit or fifty nine and three something like that uh, over his four seasons as a head coach. Uh, two national titles, one loss in the national championship game, and another season that was like fourteen and two or something like that. Yeah, and then he went out to Fresno State. And I think he got as many losses during the COVID season than he had had in his like entire head coaching career combined. Yeah. And then the next year, what did they go and win? You know, like 10, 11 games yeah, of like Fresno. Yeah, like 10 and, and 2 or at, something uh, like that, 10 and 3. Yeah. So I, and he's up at Washington. <laughs> it's super impressive. Yeah. So, and he's an offensive guy who's going to chuck the ball around. Yeah, for sure. So I think there's sort of a philosophical question that I want to pose to you. And I have thoughts on it, but I want to hear your first. At this point, in the 2023 quarterback cycle. Is it better for the program, do you think, to just kind of say, okay, you know, we've missed on every guy that we targeted. Should they put all, not put necessarily all their eggs in one basket, but really move their focus towards 2024 kids and the portal? Or should they still be, you know, spending that time trying to dig up uh, under, you know, underrated, under-recruited uh, quarterbacks for the 2023 ca- class because you only have so much time, right? You you can't spend your resources in both places. What are your thoughts here on, you know, what kind of strategy could be moving forward? So I think you can take both approaches. If, uh, if I'm Wisconsin and I know I needed a quarterback in this class, I planned on taking a quarterback in this class. I'm not going to, I'm not abandoning ship yet and I'm not giving up yet. Uh, reason being is, you know, we think of 2023 class being like almost done right now. It seems like, cause every kid's committing before, um, before summer, before their senior year, but we forget there's a whole senior year in front of us. There's going to be kids who have not necessarily played yet, have not starred yet, have not developed yet. that are going to pop up this next season. There are kids who are committed to smaller schools that are big 10 talents that Wisconsin might want to sniff around on. And uh, the thing that I is very interesting about the quarterback position is for some reason, you always see a guy at a Kent State, a Ball State, uh, a North Dakota State, a Houston, whatever it may be, who by themselves, I don't want to say by themselves, this is a team game, but they are just straight machines. And they go out there and they're plug and play and they go to the Mac and they take a team that was maybe average and... They, you know, they win nine, ten games. As you know a who is a perfect example of that? Dustin Crum, who just finished up over at Kent State. Kent State, yeah. yeah. And so I think all the way back to remember the year where Ball State like went on that roll where they oh, had yeah. the, what was the it, one Nate quarterback. White quarterback, something like that. Yeah, like just you know balling out. Uh, you look at uh, you know I've <laughs> there are coaches who have you know come in and had their first head coaching job at like Western Kentucky's and stuff like that, where they just had a dude who could slang the football or they had just got him or got him in the transfer portal. And these guys end up at this school for one or two years. Cause this guy's going out there making magic happen. And um, you know, they're not at a power five school. So you can't tell me that, you know, those kids aren't out there. I know they're out there. You have to identify them. You have to trust your evaluation. Do you take a kid just to take a kid? No, but um, I don't think it's too late. I really don't. There's going to be kids who have not. There's going to be kids who have not started a high school game at quarterback who will be Division One players at the end of this cycle. And it is still early. Now it's late in terms of quarterbacks. It's late in terms of the elite talent that we have identified, rated, ranked, has been offered. But there's players out there. I mean, there's a kid in Ohio, and I haven't seen him in person. He threw for like five thousand yards and ran for another thousand. And that's the kid like I was six, telling six you. About. That's there. the kid I was telling you about. Oh yes, yes. I was wondering how I knew about yeah, him. Yeah, that was but, me. Um, so, yeah. So I like 
I after you told me about him, I like, sent to a couple coaches. Like uh, one of my buddy is uh, FCS coach. He's like, do you know of any guys who've been overlooked at quarterback? And I and I think it was the day that you had told me about. It. I was like, yeah, I, I do know a guy. I was like, my buddy just told me about this guy today. And uh, so I sent that over. I don't know if they did anything with it, but like, there's guys like that out there, you know. And then one thing that we did, especially when I was at Dartmouth, is we would take sometimes four quarterbacks in the class, knowing that two or three of them could end up at receiver, and two or three of them would end up at receiver, and they'd be very good at it. So you can take that approach as well. You know, we're going to start this guy at quarterback. Maybe he's an inch short. Uh, maybe he doesn't have that. You know, the natural that throwing NFL mechanics of an or something arm. like that. Yeah. But he's a productive player who's a gamer, and maybe he plays a different position at the edge. So, so you're not just giving up a scholarship. You're adding depth to your quarterback room. And then uh, if you don't find anybody like that in the country, well, then, yeah, then uh, then you can go ahead and rely on the transfer portal and stuff like that. And not saying the transfer portal is a bad idea, but um, a lot of these guys are coming in to play right away, and especially if they only have one year left. And, you know, Mertz is a multi-year starter now. Uh, you know, it's not a guarantee that these guys transfer in and play. I still oh, have yeah. confidence in Merce. He, you know, he's, he's got the arm talent. He's got the ability. Um, but, you know, they need some depth in the quarterback room at the same time. So I, I do think you need to find some sort of solution. And uh, But I'd love to hear your take. Yeah, well, I, I love your, your, your thing about, you know, if you're going to, you know, go for, a, you know, under recruited kid right now, take someone who's more of an athlete than a quarterback who's playing quarterback and bring him in, you know, Maybe they turn into Owen Daniels. Who knows? But my, OD. Yeah, OD. He came in as a quarterback. He was a really accomplished quarterback in high school uh, in Illinois. Yeah, out of Naperville Central. Mm -hmm. he, he was uh, like, uh, I, I came in with him. I, I know him very well. We, um, I mean, he came in. I remember he could like one step and throw the ball 62 yards. I yeah. was like, this dude's the quarterback. All of a sudden, the, he played quarterback as a freshman at Iowa. I remember. Uh, and then... All of a sudden, he was at the tight end. And same high school as like Cameron Bray and some other NFL tight ends, yeah. too. So Absolutely, yeah. My thought, though, honestly, is spend a little bit of time on 23, but I would honestly focus my efforts on 24 in the portal. And because the issue for Wisconsin in terms, especially of this quarterback cycle, is the combination of the fact that they didn't have a recruiting department in place for the past year, right? There was no, after Saeed Khalif left, F, uh, right before official visits started pl taking place just over a year ago, they haven't. They didn't have anyone in place in the recruiting department between effectively June 1st, 2021 and after signing day, 2022. And so, and that is the key time, especially to get in with, the 23s when they are sophomores and juniors, right? Yep. To get into the, with those kids. Well, the problem is that if you don't have a recruiting department in place and you don't have a dedicated quarterback coach, you know, that is not a good combination. Throw in the fact that they had a stale offense that didn't really re scheme receivers open and didn't give Mertz a lot of time. There's not going to be, you know, a, a lot of 2023 20, kids who are going to be really interested in coming to take part of that, right? I'm not saying to throw the class away, but spend focus your time and energy on 2024 kids and maybe kids in the portal in a year from now, and not yeah. I and, mean, and, and I, don't chase. I get that. And don't chase because there's you know they still don't have a huge recording department. This isn't Georgia. This isn't Alabama. This isn't Texas A&M. They don't have a 25 person recruiting staff, so they're yeah. only going to have so much time. And you know you still need you have other positions of need and positions that you want to focus on, you know, getting a attack at Curtis, spending as much you, as you can to get him. If you think you're, you know, really in a good place with him, things like that. And personally, I'm still a big fan of Deacon Hill. I know we got a little bit bigger in the off season. My comp for him coming out of high school is Sam Ellinger, a bigger kid who can move a little bit, uh, has sneaky athleticism and has a big arm and isn't afraid he's not afraid if you watch his high school tape he's not afraid and he's a big boy and he's not a, i mean he's not like jared lorenzen out there but you know and he's, he's <laughs> you know he, he's not afraid though to use that sneak athleticism you know take a hit lower his shoulder a little bit i still think deacon hill can absolutely be a big 10 level starter so I, i'm not going to give up on him after he's only been on campus for a little bit more than a year so i i'm not in the 
you know, you know, raise all the red flags. The sky is falling because they didn't haven't landed one of their top quarterbacks for this cycle. It's honestly, it's completely explainable. If people may not like it, but it's completely understandable why it occurred. What's a little bit less yeah. understandable for <laughs> me, though, is USC and UCLA joining the Big Ten. This broke last night, uh, you know, as which is actually we were going to record yesterday. Then the news broke, so we get to talk about it today, which I'm excited about. I know you were on a podcast yesterday talking about the big news uh, out there, but I, I want to know how you think this is going to affect recruiting for the Big Ten and for those two schools, USC and UCLA, moving forward. Yeah. Um, I mean, everything is speculation right now. Like, we did this whole – I mean, this podcast last night was me and a bunch of other guys, uh, you know, Big Ten analysts and stuff like that. And, you know, it's all speculation right now. You know, we can only project. But uh, if the Big Ten's talking about looking to get to 18, 20 teams, you know, the SEC is going to do the same. Uh, I think it opens up, uh, you know, well, it does a couple things. It opens up the geography, uh, the geographical, you know, USC has always been a national recruiting team. I think one thing that they've struggled with it, with guys in the other parts of the country is they're on up there far away from home, never play a game on the East Coast outside of Notre Dame and stuff like that. Um, I think it's going to expand the recruiting footprint of both UCLA and USC, and it could hurt kind of the second tier teams in the Big Ten if they do decide to do that. They might stay with their bread and butter um, and and not target Midwest kids as much. I mean, they still do every now and then if it's a special player, if there's a connection. Uh, but I just think it expands their recruiting footprint. It can also expand some of these other, uh, you know, lower tier uh, Big Ten teams who do recruit California um, because uh, now all of a sudden those kids are seeing these teams. They recognize these teams. You know, like if I'm a kid in California and I've never watched a game of Big Ten football and I hear Purdue, Indiana, Illinois, even Wisconsin, teams that have had success, whether it's not and they're not the national brand that I grew up dreaming of playing for. Well, if all of a sudden I'm seeing them play out at the Coliseum and I get familiarity with that, I think it could also help, uh, you know, the Midwest teams, the East Coast teams expand their recruiting footprint. It's just how do they want to attack it? Do they want to take advantage of their new uh, expanded uh, visibility or do they want to stick to what they have done? But a lot of that might come down to who else comes to the Big Ten. You know, we're talking about trying to make a power conference, a super conference, and they're not done yet. And you look at the different markets. We've got Northern California, San Francisco markets. So they talk about, you know, Cal or Stanford. You've got Oregon. You've got Utah. You've got uh, the Arizona market, uh, third largest population in the U.S. in the Valley down there. That's a huge TV market. So um, you could be there. Uh, you know, the we talked about Georgia Tech last night, Notre Dame, North Carolina. I mean, these are all possibilities. So when all of this comes together, it's almost like the globalization of co college football. Everybody is going to be seen. It could change the, you know, the way players look at teams in the Midwest, the way kids from the Midwest look at players from the West Coast. And I think it will have an effect. Um, but at the end of the day, this is all going to come down to, you know, TV money and all that. And this isn't done yet. So. Uh, I think, and I don't want to say consequences, I, I think the result of this is going to be uh, almost like I talk about, you know, positionless football on defense because of spread offenses. This might be uh, geographic list recruiting because of the visibility that some of these schools are going to get in new areas in the country that they didn't before. And then also, if I'm USC and I'm playing uh, University of Wisconsin or University of Illinois or or Iowa, and there's a couple big time targets that I want to go and get eyeballs on. You know, when we're going on that trip, we just send somebody down to the school and we get to see them versus you know spending all of our time and resources going across the country for one or two select kids. So I do think that it is going to expand the footprint of all involved, and uh, it, it I you know I don't know how much it will change the dynamics, but there will be a change to the dynamics in recruiting. Oh, yeah. Well, there's obviously going to be a change to dynamics in recruiting. And I think 
that there's, I mean, I was, that it's a ton of changes, right? I mean, Los Angeles, I a, went to grad school at UCLA. I have a vested interest in the Bruins, not as much as a vested interest in Wisconsin, but, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles and I think the points that you've made about recruiting are really interesting and really good. I, I like the idea of, you know, if, you know, Illinois has a game at USC and they have 10 Southern California prospects they want to check in at, it's a lot more cost efficient to do that when you're already there for a game, right? You know, you, you just bring the scouts along on the plane and then send them, you know, get a couple rental cars, send them out to Temecula or wherever you're sending them and, you know, you know, have them connect with the recruits and the coaches and things like that from. Well, and here's, Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. No, because it was just kind of in addition to what you were saying, what a lot of these uh, kids will do too is, you know, they're on the the game pass list for USC and Illinois is playing out there. They're going to go to that game, you know, as a USC recruit, but they're going to be able to see, okay, coach came to school. Now I'm going to see what the product's like on the field. What do they coach like? So it gives them an opportunity to not see Illinois at Illinois or whatever school we're talking about, but it gets them to see that team in action. And so I think that's just another layer to what you were just saying. Sorry for cutting you off. Please finish. No. So I think for the recruiting, I think it's it's super beneficial. As someone who's a fan of college football and has grown up a fan of college football and loves college football and has a vested interest in Wisconsin and UCLA, I despise this. I yeah. absolutely positively despise this now to be fair like full disclosure i am a traditionalist my favorite saying about it is make the big 10 10 again i don't even want penn state around you know i the big 10 should have 10 teams i am the guy who wants to go back to having the big eight and the swack and a 12 team sec and a pack 10 maybe even a pack eight who knows right i you know i am Happy to go back to those days. I understand the financial aspects of this move. There is just crazy amounts of money at stake, crazy amounts of money at stake in television rights. I understand the need for the Big Ten to keep up with the SEC. They've landed Texas. They've landed Oklahoma. Those are two of the biggest fish available. And now the Big Ten goes in and lands two of the other biggest fish around you know notre dame is obviously still kicking around north carolina which everyone still believes is a you know it's a giant not just because of basketball but because of you know populations are exploding in north carolina it's a very popular place to move to these days there's a ton of talent there etc but for me and i think a lot of college football fans out there there's so much tradition and pageantry and a rivalry that goes into building the sport of college football that makes the sport of college football what it is it's why paul bunyan's acts mean something because wisconsin and minnesota play for it every single year it's you know it's why there are even more minor rivalries you know within the big 10 that might seem a little bit obscure illinois versus ohio state right i mean the the illabuck they have a trophy it's you know it's it's not very competitive obviously but there's there's still meaning behind the game right Purdue, I'm sorry, but like Purdue versus UCLA or USC versus Rutgers just isn't moving the needle for me either way. And it detracts from some of those rivalries that we have grown, you know, to see every single year and that we're accustomed to seeing. Personally, I just, the only time I want to see USC or UCLA is in the Rose Bowl. And I'm not talking about the stadium. I'm talking about the actual game. The other thing from a logistics standpoint that I worry about is Travel, especially for non-revenue sports, um, you know, or even revenue sports, you know, basketball, especially, right? If I'm a Penn State basketball player who has to travel to a night game at Pauley Pavilion on a Tuesday night, there goes my Monday, there goes my Tuesday, there goes my Wednesday, right? There's three of my five days this week that are lost to travel in the game, because if anyone knows, like, a Penn State's impossible to get to. I mean, yes, they'll yep. still be flying private, but it's you know, or charter, I should say, I I would assume, but still, it's still a pain in the butt to get from one to the other. And, you know, if you're a non-revenue sport, if you are, you know, even a quasi-revenue sport at like Wisconsin, women's volleyball or UCLA gymnastics or something like that, 
you know, it, if, if you've got to go to a meet on a, you know, especially on a weeknight uh, at Rutgers, at Maryland or something like that, if you're coming from the West Coast, the logistics are insane and it's not beneficial to the student athletes to do so. It's already hard enough to get around to Utah and Colorado from Los Angeles. It's a whole nother thing to get to College Park, Maryland or, you know, West Lafayette, Indiana. Th- it's great to hear thoughts. from another traditionalist. No, um, it was funny because I was on this podcast with a lot of the uh, you know guys who have been covering college football for a long time and college basketball for a long time. And I'm like, I'm the traditionalist here. I was like, nobody else cares. I was like, I was like, I grew up like the Rose Bowl. That was the game, you know. It and meant something, like you said. Yeah, like like you said. The first thing I thought of it was from a player and coach perspective, three time zones stretching across three time zones. Can you imagine going from uh, California to play an 11 a.m. Eastern game kickoff or 12 a.m., you know, uh, 11 a.m. Central kickoff? Like there, there's it, it's not going to be easy on the kids. And so I do think that you're going to see a little more balance. And the Pac-12 said that they're not going to, you know, that they're done or whatever or that no more teams are going to leave but i think we're going to have to find a way to get teams in the middle so that we can have a regionalization and almost divisions between it where yes there's maybe a crossover game or two like you already see in the preseason but you're playing the teams in your division that are in your region um and i think you know just from the student athlete and coaches perspective that's huge what does it do to bowl games? Uh, I love bowl games. Oh, bowl um, games. You know, I think we're looking. Yeah. We're, and, uh, yeah, you know, everybody on the podcast is like, the bowl games are meaningless. Maybe for a degenerate gambler or for, you know, a kid who wants an extra game. He's like, but, you know, you know, kids are opting out of these bowl games, all this stuff. And, you know, I just grew up and had it from my personal perspective where the bowl game was a week of fun where I got to see my dad wherever we were going. You know, bowl bonuses for coaches, extra practices to prepare your team. They're just, you know, it's the traditionalist in me. And But I knew this was coming sooner or later. You know, NIL money, TV contracts, super conferences. It was going to happen. I was just shocked by the two teams that happened with first yeah. and the timing of it. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, very interesting. It would have been much less shocking if it had been, let's say, North Carolina and Notre Dame. Or something like that, yep. right? That would have made I would have understood that a little bit more. One of the other things as expansion goes to keep a note on is the AAU, um, which is a institutional like a, a universities belong to the institution for like some of the more elite academic universities. Every Big Ten school is an AAU school, except for Nebraska. One of the many reasons I don't think Nebraska should be in the Big Ten, uh, but USC, UCLA, both in it, Washington and Oregon, both in it. Uh, which are, I would imagine, would be the Big Ten's next two uh, topics. Washington was a big one that people talked about last night uh, just because of the Seattle market, the growth of Seattle, uh, the academic profile. And uh, they're one of the teams in the Pac-12 that, you know, like college game day, it's got like a big-time experience, atmosphere, um, you know, so they would be a good fit. Um, And, yeah, it just it can go so many different directions. Uh, you know, people are kind of split on who I talked with about Oregon last night. Uh, you know, the Arizona teams, like I said, the markets, uh, Georgia, North Carolina. I mean, there's just so many different ways they could go. Uh, but if you are trying to look for 20, the last question that we uh, we talked about on the podcast was, who are the four you're going after? And for some reason, I was the only one that picked Cincinnati as one of the four, you know, and I said, this is in a perfect world. I don't know their big 12 contract. I don't know how this is going to go. Uh, I thought that this might hurt the big 12 other people's on the podcast. And I actually, after listening to their points, it might help the big 12 in the end. Um, you know, they may pick up some, you know, additional teams to what they've already had. Uh, and so there's just so many different ways this can go. I'm interested to see it's not uh, implemented until 2024. So, I have a feeling that there's some other things in the pipeline already, and they started with a bang by announcing UCLA and USC. So, yeah, I think if you're the Big Ten, you're trying to round it, round it to 20. Seattle and Washington are the first two. Uh, yeah, Seattle and Washington are definitely the first two I'm going for. Uh, you know, and in a perfect world, I mean, for me, it's Notre Dame and it's Notre Dame and North Carolina, um, 
or yeah. it's or it's if you're not gonna get Notre Dame, Notre Dame is still you know really dead set on being independent. I'd go for Virginia, North Carolina, something like that. Uh, you know, academic profile, Virginia. You know, plus you know then you can get continuity Maryland to Virginia to North Carolina. You still have this contiguous thing going on. Yeah, that was another team that was brought up a bunch was Virginia, um, Notre Dame, and so they've always wanted to remain you know independent because they have this great you know TV contract they can. They can. Um, what happens when their strength of schedule dies because these power conferences are playing only each other, you know, that could have effects on them. It might make them finally say, you know what, we can't be independent. We're going to have to, we're going to have to do this thing. If we want to be part of the conversation when it comes to the playoff, the national championship strength of schedule and maintaining, retaining these big contracts that we do have TV wise. So absolutely. Well, There will be plenty more discussion on that, not just here, but everywhere you can find Clint Cosgrove at Rivals underscore Clint on Instagram, on Twitter, all over Rivals.com and Badger Blitz. Clint, thank you so much, as always, for taking the time this week. It's a pleasure. And you can make sure to, uh, you know, subscribe to the YouTube page. uh, Check out the, uh, you know, the the den, the Badger's den over on BadgerBlitz.com. And until next time, uh, we will see you in the den. See you in the den.